In the oldest stories of many lands, the creative, generative essence of the universe is female. Jesus spoke of the goddess often, but the books that mention it uns unsurprisingly weren't included in the Bible or were mistranslated to edit out the goddess. The church wanted to keep patriarchal control and remove the goddess from Christianity. In this age, she is being revealed. Hundreds of years before Abraham migrated to what would become known as Israel, there was an earth mother and a fertility goddess. Upon entering the region, Abraham's people soon adopted her and gave her the Hebrew name Asherah. The Ugarit excavation of 1928 put Asherah the goddess on the map again, after having lost her place for thousands of years. The different groups that edited the traditions of the Pentateuch and the prophetic books of the Persian era were hostile to the traditional concepts of a divine couple. The idea that there were any other gods besides Yahweh had to be eliminated. Many have argued with good reason that this vision reflects the expelling of the goddess from Jerusalem. The book of 2 Isaiah, as well as some other texts from the Persian period, reveals a strategy to overcome the vanishing of Yahweh's wife. Second Isaiah claims frequently that Yahweh is God, or El, whatever you want to call him, and there is no one else besides him. Now, we're not concerned today with Yahweh absorbing the attributes of the God Most High, but to the claim of exclusivity. The solution in 2nd Isaiah and in some other texts from the same period is to transfer the skills of the goddess to Yahweh. A number of texts compare Yahweh to a mother, like Isaiah 49:15. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget yet, I will not forget you. A maternal metaphor also occurs in Isaiah 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb. Also in Isaiah 42, it even goes further by presenting Yahweh as a woman in pains who gives birth to Israel, his child, like a woman in labor. I groan, I will gasp and pant. Now in this passage, the return from exile is compared to the rebirth of Israel, and Yahweh resembles here a mother goddess. However, in the preceding verse, Yahweh is depicted as a warrior, preparing for battle against his enemies. Isaiah 42, 13 and 14 apparently tries to combine in regard to Yahweh the attributes of, of a warrior god and a mother goddess. Something similar happens in the late Psalms of Deuteronomy 32, where Yahweh is presented at the same time as father and mother of Israel. In verse 6, Yahweh is called father, and in verse 18, he is said to be the rock who fathered you and the God who brought you forth in labor pains. In the last chapter of the book of Hosea, which was reworked in the Persian period or even originated at that time, Yahweh also talks over the attributes. Yahweh also takes over the attributes of Asherah, since he is compared to an evergreen cypress tree that provides fertility to Israel. Israel becomes Yahweh's adulterous wife, who is punished because she is constantly looking for other lovers, that is, for gods. In Hosea 1, 3, the marriage of the prophet with the prostitute symbolizes Yahweh's relation with Israel. Now, during the Persian period, there were apparently attempts to integrate aspects of the goddess into Yahweh. However, Yahweh remained male. The goddesses were therefore transformed into new partners of Yahweh. One way to present Yahweh as a husband after the disappearance of the goddess is to transfer the divine couple to the couple Yahweh and Israel, especially in prophetic text. Israel plays here the role of Yahweh's adulterous wife who leaves him for other gods and who is therefore eventually rehabilitated. Now in some of these prophetic texts, Yahweh is also begamous since he is married to Israel and Judah, or to Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, another evolution is the personification of wisdom in the first chapters of the books of Proverbs. She is said to have been created by Yahweh in the beginning. Proverbs 8.22, but she precedes the creation of the world. She is even presented as Yahweh's craftswoman. This is possibly speaking to Proverbs 8.30, where it says, 
I was beside him as a craftsman. But the idea of a goddess who assists the creator God makes sense and reminds us of the Egyptian couple Ra and Mott. You might also ask whether the association explains the plural that the creator God is using in Genesis 1.26, let us make humankind in our image. And then humankind is created male and female, which suggests in a way that the image reflects a male and a female God. Now in the New Testament, Jesus is presented in female language. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus stands over Jerusalem and weeps, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, and you were not willing. Furthermore, the author of Matthew equates Jesus with a feminine Sophia, wisdom, when he writes, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In Matthew's mind, it seems that Jesus is the feminine wisdom of Proverbs, who was with God from the beginning of creation. And in my opinion, I think it's very likely that Matthew is suggesting that there was a spark of the feminine in the nature of Jesus. Additionally, in his letter to the Galatians, written around 54 AD, Paul says that he will continue in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Clearly, feminine imagery was accepted among the first followers of Jesus. Now, let me close with this statement. In Gnostic beliefs, Christ has two aspects, a male half, who is the son of God, and a female half, called Sophia. Sophia is the mother of the universe and is worshipped as a divine female creator and counterpart to Jesus the Christ.